welcome to the Empowered Wife Podcast, where it's all about fixing your marriage without your man's conscious effort, so you feel desired, taken care of, and special, even if your relationship feels completely hopeless. I'm Laura Doyle, and today I'm revealing two ways to make a rageaholic be respectful. My guest Kate was sure her husband was the problem. He played video games all the time and didn't help with the kids. She started talking to another man who was saying all the things she wanted to hear from her husband. And then she used a phrase that turned things around 180 degrees. And now she says she has the marriage she's always dreamed of, full of I love you's, laughter, and snuggling. She's going to tell us what she said and did so you can do it too. The worst relationship advice of the week award is a tired refrain that I had in my head in the battle days of my marriage, and here it is popping up again, presented as a modern remedy for overwhelmed wives. But it didn't work then, and it doesn't work now. All of that's coming up, but first I'm going to reveal two ways to make a rageaholic be respectful. If your husband keeps getting angry, you're not alone. When he blows a fuse at you or the kids, it can be really hurtful and scary. And when it happens again and again, then it has a way of making you angry too. Especially if he jumps down your throat at the smallest things, like how you stock the groceries or cut an onion. It's baffling when you're being nice by making his coffee or having his dinner ready when work is done. If you're doing everything you can think of to be a good wife, and still getting snapped at is downright disheartening. He wouldn't even treat the dog this way. So what can you do if your man is always angry and negative? How do you deal with a rude husband? Well, here are two proven ways to turn a rageaholic into a respectful husband. Number one, rewind the tape to see what happened just before the rage started. This sounds crazy because he's the one who's behaving badly and being mean, but his reactions could be an opportunity to look at your side of the street to see whether anything needs cleaning up. His anger might be 95% of the problem or 99% of the problem, and that's easy to focus on. But it's a rare, wise woman who can also ask herself, did I do or say anything that wasn't so great? When Anna's husband kept getting annoyed with her day after day, it was as if she couldn't do anything right. She felt completely disrespected, which is when she decided to take a look at how she was doing in the respect department. That's when she realized that all this started after she offered to call the exterminator. That sounds harmless enough, right? Even helpful, maybe. But Anna knew that helpful in wife language meant controlling in husband language. She was afraid that their Airbnb guests would have unexpected pest visitors and she would be humiliated online. Sure enough, she was trying to control her husband to take care of the problem before they left town. And as with all control, it was because she was afraid. Granted, that seems like a very small transgression to Anna and it might to you too. But check out what happened when she decided to clean up her side of the street by saying, I apologize for being disrespectful when I tried to control how you handled the pest situation. The tone in her house immediately improved. Her husband thanked her for all she'd been doing to prepare for their trip, and he insisted that she go relax and get her nails done. The new tone of mutual respect and gratitude carried into their long drive where he couldn't do enough to please her. Even with two little ones in tow, it turned out to be a romantic road trip. Number two, catch him in the act. If you've been dealing with his outbursts for a while now, it's easy to catch him doing something wrong, right? The problem with that is you are a powerful manifester. And what you focus on increases. That's why every time you bring up this problem, even if it's an attempt to solve it, it magnifies and gets even worse. Even gently offering support by saying something like, is there anything I can do to take the stress off your plate? That's being helpful. 
or helpfully observing that he's been getting angry a lot lately, that creates even more distance and likely more anger. What if you tried something different, like catching him right in the act of doing something good? If he responds calmly to a breakdown, any breakdown, you could focus on that by saying you love how he stays so calm and cool under pressure. Saying that would probably feel like a big fat lie. But is it any more of a lie than telling yourself he's always angry? No one's always angry. It's not possible. So if you're going to lie, you might as well stretch the truth in the direction that serves you, right? What difference does it make what you tell yourself or what you tell him? Well, everything in my experience. Because what I focus on increases. If your husband is a rageaholic, you might think all of this sounds too good to be true and maybe it, it won't work for you. But when women on our campus find the courage to experiment, even when they think it's completely hopeless, well, to paraphrase Thomas Wolfe, miracles not only happen around here, they happen all the time. If you'd like to be my guest on the Empowered Wife podcast and share about how you fixed a struggling relationship using the six intimacy skills, I would love to interview you. Just go to lauradoyle.org slash podcast dash guest to let me know that you are willing to make a big contribution to ending world divorce by telling your relationship story. I look forward to meeting you. That's lauradoyle.org slash podcast dash guest. My guest Kate was sure her husband was the problem. He played video games all the time and didn't help with the kids. She started talking to another man who was saying all the things she wanted to hear from her husband. Then she used a phrase that turned things around 180 degrees. And now she says she has the marriage she's always dreamed of, full of I love you's, laughter and snuggling. She's gonna tell us what she said so you can do it too. Kate, welcome to the Empowered Wife podcast. I'm so happy to have you on the show. Hi, Lori. Thank you for having me. So we want to hear what things were like in the bad old days. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, like a lot of the guests, I kind of want to bring you back to the good old days. Um, sure. Everybody always starts. You've got to kind of get to the good stuff before you get to the bad stuff. Um, my husband and I met in high school. Um, we started dating when we were 18. Um, we are going on 10 years now. So there's been a lot of ups and downs throughout then. Um, we started off, we were really great friends. Everything was a lot of fun. We joked all the time. Um, but you know, we had a really serious relationship pretty early on. Um, I realized looking back that a lot of our issues kind of prompted from me. Um, I always thought that he was the issue. He loved playing video games. He loved working on his car. Um, some of these hobbies seem to take precedence over our time together and over him wanting to spend time with me. Um, reflecting back on the good old days, I started kind of seeing where I went wrong. I started seeing a lot of... Um, nagging. I constantly would ask him, why aren't you spending time with me? Why don't you want to do this with me? Um, even to the point, Laura, where I was bringing up uh, marriage a lot sooner than he was. We didn't get married until we were together for about six years. We had already had one child together. Um, I just started realizing that I was very naggy and I was always asking him, you know, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? Um, and he would retreat. And, you know, after I started reading your book, I started realizing that I would probably do the same thing. I wouldn't want to be with somebody um, who was always complaining and controlling and wanting to just take, take the reins over the whole relationship. Um, but yeah, the battle days really started um, about the time we had our first child. Um, as many moms know, it's a huge life shift. Uh, 
it can be very lonely. Um, I actually struggled with postpartum depression with both of our kids. Mm. Um, asking him, you know, to help me around the house. I thought I was asking, it was very demanding. It was very mm. negative and controlling. Um, and a lot of these criticisms came out and like it says in the book, like you talk about on the, on the podcast all the time, uh, those criticisms are not, they're not attractive. <laughs> Nobody wants to feel like they're doing the wrong thing all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, but we kind of muddled through uh, a couple of years. Well, I guess it was about a year and a half um, after our son was born, we got married. Things seemed really good. We went through the honeymoon stage. Um, mm-hmm. I very soon got pregnant with our second. Uh, and after I had our daughter, it got really bad. Uh, got to the point where I felt like he didn't want to spend any time with me. He never was complimenting me. He was always playing video games. Um, It just got very lonely. And I started talking to a good friend of mine from high school uh, who was a guy (laughs) who my husband kept asking me not to talk to him. And Mm. I kept telling him, you know, we're just friends. We're just friends. He's just being friendly. And he was, he was there for me in a time I felt very lonely and we started crossing some boundaries, started talking about things we shouldn't have. And that's when things got really, really bad is when he started saying all the right things, all the things I wanted my husband to say that he just wasn't. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much when it got to the lowest point in our marriage. And these are things that every woman really longs to hear, right? We all want to feel special and desired and, Mm -hmm. you know, the most beautiful or amazing or attractive. And um, so just as a mere mortal woman and, and you, you had no knowledge, you had no understanding of why that wasn't coming from your husband, why he, why he wasn't saying those things. So Mm -hmm. in a way, I I guess I just want to talk for a minute about how that must've felt like a, a tall glass of water in the desert. It doesn't sound, it sounds like you're not proud of it, but it also sounds like it was something you just so desperately needed. Like I think mm-hmm. a lot of women can relate to that when you're feeling so lonely in your marriage. Yeah. And looking back, um, if I'm being completely honest, it didn't feel like I was doing anything wrong in the moment. I was just getting what I needed. I was not feeling loved. I was not feeling appreciated. And I couldn't understand why he didn't want to talk to me, why he didn't want to be around me. And there was somebody readily available who did want to talk to me, who did want to, you know, say all these right things. And it, it felt good in the moment. And it was really easy to get sucked into that when you were feeling that low. Yeah, absolutely. And and feels justified in a way too, because I mean, I can never get that from him. He's, he's busy playing video games and working on his car and, Mm -hmm. um, very distant. So, I mean, it just is, uh, you know, a situation where, um, I mean, I just, I remember feeling similarly lonely and just thinking, you know, I need to feel, I need to feel like I'm, I'm special. And, and of course the, the guy from high school wasn't getting the nagging and the criticism, that you were giving. Okay. And so, okay. So, all right. So this is kind of a low point. You're talking to this guy, your husband's asking you not to, uh, what happened then? Uh, well, after then, um, I guess a couple months went by, we were talking and, um, my husband found out and he grabbed my phone and was reading these messages. Um, things got really bad. And I ended up staying with a friend for a couple weeks Um, my husband and our kids stayed at home and I was not there for a few weeks. Um, my husband basically told me that he still wanted to make our marriage work, which to me was huge. It had honestly felt like we were going down this path of separate ways. And, and this was prior to him finding out about everything and for him to say, you know, you messed up, but I still love you. And I still want to make this work was huge to me because I thought I had already lost him. Um, so we had started couples counseling as many couples do. And as you can imagine it, the first few weeks were harping on me (laughs) and everything I had done, um, in the marriage, I had stepped out. I had been disrespectful to my husband. Um, and 
you know, a few weeks in, we started kind of getting into like what you and I just talked about, kind of not justifying it, but understanding why it happened and understanding where I was coming from. And he felt so attacked. Um, And I just remember him getting so mad and saying, we are done. We are not going back to counseling. Um, We've got to figure out something else, but we are not going back to counseling because my voice was starting to be heard. And I start, I felt so hurt. Um, because I was feeling like somebody actually cared. Someone actually, um, was justifying my feelings. And although I was in the wrong, I, there was a reason that this all happened. Um, so I went to the bookstore and I went through, I came home with a new daily devotional, a new Bible and the empowered wife. (laughs) And I remember just sitting down and reading it cover to cover. And I was floored. Um, I had, you know, really just started thinking about all of these things that I had done and how naggy I was. And I remember coming up to my husband, um, And at this point I had just started sleeping back in our bed. He had asked me to come home. Um, I was on the couch for a while and he finally asked me to come back to bed and I had finished the book and I came up to him and I just put my arm around him and I said, honey, I am so sorry for being disrespectful. And that's all I said. Now, uh, six months ago, I would have said, I'm sorry for being disrespectful, but you did this. And this is why I did this. And it would have just escalated to a huge argument. Um, But I just simply bit my tongue and I apologized and it was sincere. And I left it at that. And I left the room. And I remember he just was floored. Um, it was so out of character for me (laughs) and he just came downstairs and he held me and hugged me and we just cried. Both of us just sat in the kitchen and just cried. And that was such a huge turning point. Um, that was really one of the first steps that I did. I had started doing self-care, um, as a mom of two, I (laughs) have a very hard time with that. Um, but I started doing that and I just apologized to him. And that just was a complete shift in our marriage and our relationship. Well, I love that you became willing to say those words to him, but how, how did you get yourself there? Because that's a hard thing to say, right? (laughs) Yeah, it was, it was hard. Um, in all honesty, I just, took a few weeks of reflecting, um, of just trying to recognize how, um, disrespectful I had been really kind of throughout the course of our relationship, not just with speaking to somebody else, not just with nagging and telling him how to do things and, you know, complaining with when he didn't do things, but just trying to take accountability and realize that, you know, I, I'm not perfect. <laughs> Nobody's perfect, but um, just trying to point out all of these, t- I don't want to, well, I'm just going to say toxic traits um, that I think maybe I have had in our marriage, in our relationship, um, and even outside of our marriage, just some traits that I think needed to be stopped. Um which is hard. It's very hard to say, (laughs) Um, but I truly do believe that we've all been toxic in parts of our lives and seasons of our lives. And if we truly want to get through that, we need to recognize that and um, just acknowledge it and figure out a way to stop that behavior. And for me, accountability has been the biggest Uh, way of doing that. And that's not to say I don't have him come home from work and complain about the dishes not being done or, you know, him not playing with the kids immediately. But I feel like I've been able to stop myself and recognize when I see those toxic traits coming and very quickly put a stop to them and apologize and say, okay, I'm sorry for being disrespectful when I did this. And it just has been a huge shift. It's been a huge shift. Those were magic words in your marriage. It sounds like. Yeah, they really were. 
And so what about the resentment, right? Because I heard some resentment, I think, earlier on about him always playing video games, working on the car, just Mm -hmm. being leaving you alone. Uh, What'd you do with that? Um, well, that's been still tough. Um, my biggest love language is words of affirmation. And that is something that I have not always had and continue to not always get. Um, but just communicating to him that I want to spend time with you, just having those desires and expressing them and just simply saying, I would love if you and I would watch a movie tonight when the kids go to bed. Or I would love if we could go on a date sometime this week and not having any expectation of that happening, but simply expressing that because I really don't think he understood how badly I wanted to just spend quality time together, just the two of us. Um, So really just expressing those desires and not having an expectation because if you have an expectation and it's not met, then you just kind of resent them more. <laughs> and yeah. then you're just kind of a yeah. little more, um, on edge about things. Um, <sighs> and if he chooses to work on the car some night, then I will watch a movie by myself. <laughs> then mm-hmm. I will, it's not going to be the end of the world, but at least I've expressed to him what I truly want when I don't want him to work on the car. What is that? Do I just want him to be inside? No, I want to spend quality time. So just expressing those desires and pure desires without any expectation has been a huge way of helping with that. Mm, Yeah. Sounds good. So, um, so how do he, how has your relationship changed? Oh my gosh. It's been so different. Um, I just remember, a few months ago, I mean, this has all been very fresh. It's been less than a year since he found out about me talking to somebody else. Um, and it took a few months of me practicing the skills. Um, but things have been so different. I mean, he is excited to come home. Um, when he gets home, he will come give me a big kiss. He Mm. has been sick recently. Um, so I've been doing just what I would normally do, making him food, helping more with the kids, not expecting him to take care of them. And he thanked me yesterday. He thanked me for taking care of the kids, which (laughs) is so out of character for him. Um, That's your love language. It sounds like. Yes. Uh, He's acknowledging these things I'm doing. He's um, very affectionate. He's been very playful. I think that was one of the main things to me that stood out that was like, whoa, this is really working because we used to be so playful. Like he will just come up behind me when I'm cooking dinner and just hug me or kiss my forehead or smack my butt and walk away. Like it's just been so (laughs) playful and we just, we have fun and we joke around and like, he makes me coffee in the morning. He, he's just thoughtful. And it's amazing to me, the shift from this recluse (laughs) that I was with. Um, but I mean, you really, you sit there and you think about it and nobody wants to be playful with somebody who's constantly telling them what they're doing is wrong or how they're loving them is not right. Or, you know, like I, I shut down when somebody tells me that. So why would he not shut down? Like I, it's just, it's been a huge change even over the last six months of just kind of those cold war fights of not even talking or just kind of huffing and puffing away to having more open communication and telling him how I'm feeling in a nice way and shifting that you can definitely tell him, you know, I'm, you know, not enjoying when you're away from me in a nice way, you don't have to be so naggy and demanding to get your point across. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's big. And, um, I'm guessing nobody ever taught you how to say these things previously. No, no, I come from a broken home. My husband, his family is not very, um, they don't have healthy communication. They never have 
we neither of us had a good example of what a healthy marriage looks like. And I feel like many people don't. We were never taught this in school. Nobody yeah. teaches you how to be respectful. Nobody teaches you how to communicate properly without being demeaning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's so true. So, um, and how are you different now that you are communicating these things this way? I feel like my confidence is higher. I feel (laughs) not to sound cliche, but I feel empowered. I truly do. I feel like I'm able to communicate without breaking him down, without, you know, demasculating him or making myself out to be a martyr. Um, I just feel like I'm, I'm more confident in every relationship that I'm in. Um, with my friends, with my kids, I, I admit when I'm in the wrong, I try to be very accountable and you weren't doing that before. I was not doing that before. No, Laura, I was perfect. I was not the problem. <laughs> Everyone else was the problem. How could I, how could I be the problem? But truly, I mean, you, you can't have healthy relationships if you can't admit when you're wrong. And we've all been wrong. <laughs> yeah, we all have. It's yes. Inevitable. That's really true. It almost sounds like you like being able to say you were wrong. It almost sounds like you like it. You know, it's funny because I, I'm a pretty proud person. I don't like admitting when I'm wrong. Um, I don't think anybody enjoys. <laughs> I tell. Um, yeah, no. But I have found that when I can admit when I'm wrong and take ownership and accountability, that it's easier for me to correct that behavior. It's easier for me to also um, show grace when other people are wrong and be more forgiving. I feel like I am less of a grudge holder now where I used to just... I was so angry. I was such an angry person. Um, I was very resentful towards a lot of people. And I feel like letting that go and admitting when you're wrong. Um, I don't know. It's, I don't, I don't like saying I'm wrong. I'm not proud of what I did. I'm not proud of how I've treated him. Um, but I will say I am proud of how I've handled it. I'm proud of (laughs) being able to admit that I was wrong and, and moving forward and knowing that I'm not going to do that again. And if I am disrespectful in any other way, which let's be honest, we're all mere mortal women and we're going to be <laughs> disrespectful. We're going to have off days mm-hmm. um, that I can be strong enough to call myself out and fix that behavior. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess I kind of might say that I'm. I'm enjoying being able to admit when I'm wrong more so than I thought I would. (laughs) Yeah. Right. I admire that very much. It's such an attractive quality. Uh, I mean, and I think you, you're seeing that from your husband's Mm -hmm. response. You saw it from day one when you took accountability without, like you said, you cut yourself off. I apologize. I'm sorry. I was disrespectful. And then you stopped. You didn't say, but blah, blah, blah. Right. So uh, anyway, it just is, it's remarkable. I think it's, I mean, it's, it's kind of a rare quality really that you've cultivated, mm-hmm. um, uh, using your, your marriage as a way to develop yourself, right? Yeah. The crisis in your marriage created this opportunity for you to become the best Kate you can be. Uh, mm-hmm. So I think, I think that's kind of cool. Mm-hmm. So, and h- how has it affected your kids that you've, had this transformation to this accountable person. It's so funny. So our oldest is turning five actually this month and our youngest is two and a half. So they're pretty young. Um, but I mean, even with them, mommy has really tough days. Mom will still (laughs) snap sometimes, but even admitting to them, and I don't use the term, I'm sorry for being disrespectful because they're young, but just kind of changing that verbiage to, I'm sorry. I yelled at you. I'm sorry that mommy snapped at you. 
it just my our son will just give me a huge hug and say it's okay mommy it's okay <laughs> like it's again, just taking accountability. And my goal with that too, is to teach them to take accountability. Um, because that was not something I was taught as a kid. And I feel like it would have saved so much heartache, (laughs) um, to just admit when you're wrong, I tell them, you know, you're not in trouble. If you did something wrong, you know, what's going to get you in trouble is lying about it. And (laughs) I mean, mommy got in trouble for lying about it too. You know, (laughs) it's, I just, I'm trying to lead by example and trying to instill these skills to my kids, um, just in general and hoping that it translates when they're older and in relationships too, but even in their friendships and, you know, being held accountable in school, I just, it seemed to make a really big difference. Um, instead of just snapping at them and leaving it, just admitting when you're wrong in all aspects of life, really. And so you're creating, uh, emotional safety, a lot Mm -hmm. of emotional safety at your house all around with, I mean, it must just melt you when you get a hug, like that's, oh my gosh. (laughs) Yeah. Mama dreams right there. Right. Yeah. Good mama moment. I love it. So, um, and what, what would you say to a woman who is where you were, where she's feeling like she can get what she needs outside of her marriage, but there's no way she's going to get it in her marriage from her husband, Mm -hmm. those emotional needs. Um, but she wants what you have where he's smacking your butt and, uh, (laughs) you know, you guys are laughing together and he's smiling when he comes home, where should she start? You know, Laura, I just, I really feel like you need to just kind of reflect on the good old days. You know, you, you, are with that person for a reason. You wouldn't have married him if he was (laughs) a loser. (laughs) You know, you wouldn't have married him if all he did was play video games or work on the car or, you know, but just trying to reflect on what things were like and, you know, having the strength to recognize that maybe you're not the fun loving woman that he fell in love with either. Maybe maybe there's a reason that he's kind of become a recluse and just trying to get back to yourself. I mean, even the other day, my husband, we were joking about something. I don't even remember what we were talking about, but I would have taken such offense to it. (laughs) And I just started laughing and he just looked at me and he held me and he was like, there she is. And it just, just try to remember the easy days of, you know, when he calls you answer the phone excitedly. Hey honey, how are you? You know, I mean, just, it makes the world a difference just to kind of go back to that mindset, try to focus on the good. There's always going to be bad. There's always going to be something negative, but try to focus on the positive and it'll, it'll make a world of difference. I love that story where he said, and he started laughing and he said, there she <laughs> is. Cause I hear that you missed him. Yeah. It sounds like he missed you too. Yeah. He missed the real you, mm-hmm. that woman of fun and light. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love it. So, um, and what would you say to yourself if you could go back in time and tell yourself <laughs> what you know now? Oh my gosh. I don't even know where to begin. <laughs> um, I mean, to be honest, there's a lot of things I wish I could warn myself about. Um, as you can imagine, I would want to tell myself not to do some of the things I did. Don't, don't answer that phone call. Don't respond to that text. Um, but if I'm being completely honest, that, that is a big moment in our marriage that brought us to where we are now. And I think if I could go back and tell myself anything, it would be to just hang on it's going to get better. It's going to be 10 times better than what you ever imagined. This is the marriage that I wanted, um, where, you know, he comes home and the kids run to him. He comes home and he, you know, has to kind of squeeze past them to get to me. And (laughs) it's just, it's going to get better. You've just got to stay true, trust the process it's not a comfortable process, but nothing, nothing that is worth having comes easily. 
Um, so just to hold on, it's, it's going to get a lot better. Mm. Well, I love that. And it sounds almost like you're grateful for the breakdown. Yeah. What came before the breakthrough in a weird way. I am because I truly don't know where we would be if that didn't happen. And as much as I wish I could take all of that back, I don't know where we'd be without it. Yeah. It's all part of your journey and yeah. um, you're embracing it all and it's gotten you to here, which is a, there's a, an inspiring um, like family portrait uh, of kids who run to the door to see dad and dad who's squeezing past them to get to mom yeah. and saying, there she is, there she is. <laughs> so it's just beautiful, Kate. Congratulations on Thank you. fixing your family. Uh, you're, it's a big accomplishment. It's a really big accomplishment, right? There was a, another path you could have gone down, yeah. um, where this family looks very different. Yeah. Uh, and so it's really important work that you did. Yeah, no. Yeah. And I'm very grateful. I'm so grateful for all the work that you've put into this because I don't know where we would have been <laughs> without that guidance. Mm. Well, thank you for your contribution and sharing so vulnerably and personally today. Yeah. to uh, help end world divorce, inspire uh, other women who are, are listening and wondering if this could be um, how their story ends also with a, a happily ever after. Yeah. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. If you're wondering how to get started with fixing your relationship and making it shiny again, then you need a roadmap. Get six simple steps to follow that will set your relationship up for success. Discover three common mistakes that wives make trying to fix their relationship but just make things worse. When you download my free Adored Wife Roadmap, you can do that at getcherished.com. Go to getcherished.com now to get your roadmap in minutes. And now it's time for the Worst Relationship Advice of the Week Award. It's the Worst Relationship Advice of the Worst Relationship Advice. Yeah, it's the Worst Relationship Advice of the Worst Relationship Advice of the Week. And the advice that has been an uproar this week was sent to me by a student who read an article called This is the Real Reason Women Are Quote-Unquote Control Freaks. The student summarizes that the message of the article is that when a wife flashes out at her husband for doing something wrong, he needs to man up and learn from her to be a better partner. And this student is absolutely right that this is useless, annoying advice, which I can't wait to chop into little pieces like sushi. So thank you for sending this in. This is really fun for me. Shout out to you for the contribution and the love. I'm grateful. The article starts with the author describing how often she said, just let me do it when her husband was dressing the kids or making a list of things to do for a birthday party. And it ends with her concluding that, quote, men need to step up to meet women where they are. Now, anytime the advice for a woman is that men need to change, <laughs> I become very agitated because in my experience, you can't change your husband that way. So this bad advice is worse than no advice. Of course, you can influence him. You can inspire him. You can encourage him. But saying that the answer to her problems is that, quote, men need to step up, that's both implying that he's not stepping up like he should and that she should make him somehow. Oh, sure, you can, you can sit around and blame him for a while. I mean, that's tempting. That's very tempting at times. But it doesn't get you anywhere. If your car won't start, saying cars need to start when women want them to isn't going to get you where you want to go. Of course it doesn't. But even worse, it's pretty insulting to men, to the whole gender, to say they aren't stepping up, like they're not even trying, or they're just the stupid gender. But if they were really that clueless, why would we have married them to begin with? I mean, they must have had something amazing about them, right? 
And I get it. I remember feeling the same way back in the bad old days. I mean, why can't my husband just do some of these very simple things that he should be able to do the way I want him to do them? The illusion was very strong for me that if only he would change, then I would be happy because then I wouldn't have to do so much work and be so responsible for everything and supervise everything. If only he knew how to do things the right way my way, then I'd be able to sleep with both eyes shut. But hidden in that complaint is my lazy desire. It always is. That's what complaints are. They're just lazy desires, upside down desires. What I desired was to have more free time. I desired to relax. I thought if he would step up more, I would have more free time to relax. But I couldn't make him step up and trying was wearing me out even more. It was exhausting. It wasn't until I figured out what I wanted and expressed those desires in a way that inspires him that I started to get what I really wanted. And I see no mention of that anywhere in this article. Just this disempowering theme of how men are to blame and no clues of how to get to the other side where you're feeling taken care of and cherished and adored. And for that reason, the advice that men need to step up to meet women where they are is the very, very worst relationship advice I have heard all week. Listen and subscribe to the Empowered Wife Podcast. Next week, I'll share three secrets you need to know if your marriage is unhappy. In the meantime, I hope you're having lots of fun. Today's fun fact is that our front doormat looks very suspicious. It says, definitely not a trap door right on it.